Welcome to the USIA podcast. I'm Ian Bott. Ian Terry is a winner of the strategic reality game show, Big Brother, a championship level backgammon master and a personal friend. After growing up in Pittsburgh and graduating with a chemical engineering degree from Tulane University in New Orleans, Ian went on to become an AP physics teacher before transitioning into a career in management consulting. I first met Ian as we embarked upon our teaching careers at the same school in Southeast Houston. And we discuss a bit about our shared experiences in education. He's a true strategist in every sense of the word and would often find time to share brain teasers or other puzzles with me between classes or after school. I enjoyed talking with Ian about his strategic approach towards games, as well as the many applications of game theoretic principles to life in general. After returning for the recent 2020 edition of Big Brother All-Stars, Ian opened up about his experiences living with autism. So we delve into how we can promote destigmatization and advocate for individual human differences in a way that maximizes human potential. And also how we consider not just the limitations, but also the strengths that often accompany learning differences. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Ian. Ian, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. So for those who aren't familiar with you, at 21 years old, you became the youngest ever winner of the US version of Big Brother, which is a popular reality TV show. Uh, and you quickly became a fan favorite because of your strategic mind and your ability to outmaneuver opponents. Uh, what about your strategic approach allowed you to be successful in a game like Big Brother? Yeah, so I think at the time, uh, what really gave me a, a pretty solid advantage uh, against the other players was that I had a, um, a really strong uh, idea of what the show was like because I had watched it a lot. Um, and it gave me uh, a pretty decent idea of what strategies at that time were ones that tended to be successful in the game. Um, essentially, what I had realized was um, in 2012, the, the state of the game heavily favored um, this sort of under the radar technique. Um, people will get into the house, they'll get into arguments over things that are really just not important, like putting too much cheese on lasagna or things like that. Um, if you just keep your mouth shut and stay out of the fray, um, let other people get in their own way, you'll be around towards the end game, more likely than not. And the other thing was, the end game competitions, which if you win one of those, you are immune for that round of play. Um, they were the same things pretty much every year. So um, same questions and everything just modified to be specific to that season. So if you study those, then, you know, and you, you've done your homework, you've done your due diligence, it gives you an overwhelming advantage in the game. So you stayed under the radar, you had an intimate knowledge of, of the game's details. Yes. Um, and recently you returned for the 2020 edition of um, Big Brother All-Stars. Yes. I think it was a very different dynamic. Um, very different. You were a former winner. So do you want to talk about like the sure. difference coming in? Versus yeah. So I, I think that one of the things that I had working for me uh, in the original season was um, it was it was not known what I was capable of, right? Um, obviously, you know, you're not walking around wearing a t-shirt saying, you know, like, I know all the details of every competition that will come up later on. So that's not something that's going to be a concern to the other contestants. Um, going in this time, that was something that uh, a lot of the key players were keenly aware of. Um, ones that had done their homework uh, recognized that that was something that I had pulled off previously. So that was a bit of a challenge um, going in. Um, additionally, um, I hadn't watched the show in a few years. So there were you know, a few slight changes to just the, the overall structure of the game that I wasn't really aware of. Um, mm -hmm. And so that gave me a little bit of a disadvantage over perhaps the players that were on in more recent years. Um, and it, I think one of the other more interesting things was since it was all returning players, the Big Brother community um, is, is a small one. And um, in some capacity, especially folks that were on in more recent years, um, 
that's going to be relatively tight knit for people that have not been on the show for a long time. Maybe you've been doing, you know, other jobs, other things, not participating in big brother related events, then um, it sort of creates a dynamic of, you know, almost this like new school, old school um, idea where people that are in the loop have this sort of like built in uh, relationship, you know, going in um, and that people that are not in the loop kind of are on their own in a way. So most of us will never be a contestant on Big Brother. So I wanted to get your perspectives around what it's like. Uh, it's an interesting social experiment because you're continuously being monitored by live cameras and microphones. Yes. What is it like to be under public scrutiny constantly? And have you found it difficult? Yeah, I find, I find that the, the return back to the, the real outside world can often be as taxing as actually being in the house and, and playing the game in terms of stress. Um, uh, being on the show itself is, is a really interesting beast. Um, essentially, you're in this house. It's not really a house. It's a soundstage. Um, you're completely isolated from any sort of outside world news, um, any events of that nature. You have no idea what's going on outside of the walls of that soundstage. Um, and interestingly, uh, you, you don't have any idea of what's going on inside either, right? There's a lot of, um, you know, making secret deals, concealing alliances. Um, so you're basically in this, this isolation bubble, uh, if you will. And that, that can be very stressful. It's very paranoia inducing. Um, I think what makes it interesting, um, a lot of the times in most seasons of Big Brother, just given the way that the payout structure works, um, most players generally are playing over their head as far as money goes. So that makes that really interesting. So there's that emotional um, factor that comes into play. Um, and and it, can be, it can be a really difficult game. Um, outside, um, you know, you're under public scrutiny. Um, I think generally I've been well received both times that I was on. I mean, obviously everyone's going to have detractors, but um, so for me, that's very fortunate. I don't really know like the, the cold side of that coin, but um, definitely can be stressful. I always say if it was just a house in the desert and you know, it was, it was ca you know, cameras so that producers could see, but no one ever saw the show, then it would probably be a lot easier. I, I would agree. I, I thought you did a really good job coming across as your authentic self, despite being in this high stake and stakes environments. Yes. Environment. I never really felt like there was a big disconnect between Ian, the TV personality and right. who you are in real life, right? Right. Um, and I, I think that's why people tended to like you. Um, but I'm wondering how you view the whole production side of things. Um, it almost seems like you're caught up in this whole circus and, and to some extent right. you don't have control over how you know, the editing goes and, and the right. narratives that are formed. So like, how do you feel about um, being a part of all of that? Yeah, I mean, it is, that is really interesting, right? Um, you know, there, there is a live feed, right? Um, which is broadcast nearly 24 seven with some outages for, you know, production talk or competitions, um, which does give uh, anyone who wants it, you know, a, a, I would say a more, developed perspective on the show, but it's still not a full perspective, right? Um, there's only two cameras or, or two rooms shown on the feed at any time out of a pretty large house. So conversations can be missed. Um, someone that you see on the feed saying one thing could be lying or telling a specific person what they want them, what they think they want them to hear. So um, really you have the diary room, which, which is where you're sharing your actual thoughts with production and that can make error, but sometimes it doesn't make error. So what you do can be left up for interpretation. Right. And I wanted to focus some on your strategic approach. Yes. Um, in the previous game, it felt like, you know, you were kind of biding your time, ready to, to put these plans into action, but you never really got to do so, um, partly because of just the dynamics of the game right. itself. Um, but what, one thing I did notice is you 
would often speak in terms of percentages and probabilities yes. while you're describing your possible game decisions, right? right? Like usually when you ask a contestant, who are you, who are you voting out? They would give yes. you an advancer, right? Or, or just kind of, you know, him haw around, around it. Exactly, right? You, you are very upfront about, you know, oh, it's 70-30, it's 55-45, right? Yeah. So I'm wondering one was like, were you being honest? And yeah. then two, you were being, oh, so, and, and then what was the cognitive process that actually led to that conclusion? Well, um, you know, I, I obviously, and we'll get into, I, I play backgammon a lot. So I have a tendency to think and speak in terms of probabilities. Um, and uh, one of the things that I keep in mind with Big Brother is, um, you know, things are constantly changing. Um, there's a lot of shifts and you have to take everything frame by frame. So uh, what might be a definitive answer on Tuesday could um, not so much this season, but it could in, in previous seasons change by Thursday. And I often felt that by speaking in terms of probabilities, it was just me giving a rough estimate of how likely I thought things were going to go in the game, where my best decision would be voting out this person 75% of the time with, um, you know, with, with that being my best move, right? So, um, I would just give that probability. And I felt like this was actually a pretty good idea um, for a few reasons. One, um, part of it is this idea of, oh, I wanna just stay out of the way. Um, so if I say one thing, go back on it, then you're kind of building up this credit score in the house. And if I'm just constantly making these deals that I'm going back on, it's going to look bad, right? Um, you know, in the event that I, get nominated or something against someone uh, for elimination, then those things could come back to bite me. But if I have a relatively clean record um, or I haven't said much, um, then there's not a lot that can be used against me. So I would definitely do that um, when I was playing. It's very interesting. And, and presumably you have to project out into the future right. and anticipate all the possible nodes of, of the right. game, right? Um, exactly. And, and, and that requires you to plan from a, a long-term perspective. Yes. Um, for example, there were times where, you know, I was pretty sure that you were throwing competitions deliberately, right. even, even though there's a short-term reward for winning, um, right. you're trying to position yourself more broadly. Um, so could you talk about like how you- Absolutely. That? Yeah, so, I mean, essentially the way that I, I view the competitions is, um, you know, before I left, uh, I kind of toyed around with this idea of, of what, what I call efficiency. Um, like you said, it, it can bring a short-term reward, um, but if you don't use that uh, competition win in a way that's efficient, say you win it and then you, you, know, you don't do anything with the role, as I would say, um, then you haven't really accomplished anything. Um, unless you're getting like a nice value add, then there's really no good reason to win that, you know, a particular competition if it's not going to be efficient. Or if there's a very good chance that it won't end up being efficient for you, then it's probably best to throw it. Um, and as I had said, I, I like to just think of the game in terms of, um, all right, well, the probability of this happening is this. Um, so yeah, if I throw it, there's a you know, I have some exposure on the downside, but it's a small amount that I'm willing to live with um, in exchange for what I think is passing up on the short-term gain of doing this, playing super, super tight, right? I would call it. Um, and just, you know, weighing out the costs, the benefits, and then the expected returns on those. So I'm interested in how we take this kind of thinking and apply it not only to Big Brother, but to life, right? Yep. It, it seems like the ability uh, to think in these kinds of longer time periods is something that is, is somewhat unique to us as humans. Right. And yet, and yet we also often discount the future right. rewards right. in favor of immediate satisfaction, right? Absolutely. So, so do you think that these kinds of long-term thinking strategies can be taught? Do you feel like 
we can Absolutely. teach them. Absolutely. I think that for me, um, like, I, I know that, like, this is something I heard a very good backgammon player say uh, quite recently, is a lot of people, um, they don't like gambling, right? They, they, they don't like the idea of, of gambling, betting on things. And I find that, and, and this backgammon player found it to be interesting. I mean, literally everything you do in life, to an extent, is some sort of gamble where you're weighing the costs and the rewards, right? Um, you know, obviously, are you safer, you know, let's say, you know, non-COVID world, just to make it a general idea, right? Are you safer? Are you less likely to get into an automobile accident if you never leave your house? Well, yes, but most people are willing to step into a car every day and put themselves in that situation so that they can go to work and, and make money at a job because they weigh out that cost and reward. Um, so I think that these ideas come up all the time in daily life. People just don't really realize them. And I think that by playing vacuum and, um, and I think a little bit, you know, I took some courses in college in economics department uh, at Tulane, in the economics department at Tulane, uh, where I sort of got these ideas down uh, a little bit more solidly. I think uh, back in and sort of taught me an application of that, that it was just directly useful because the math is just so clear. Um, and I saw it really in an academic way uh, in my undergraduate studies. It, it's a really important thing to understand. And I had um, the social psychologist Richard Nisbet on the, the yes. podcast recently, and he was he was really advocating for we should we should emphasize these things in school. Absolutely. Uh, another thing that I thought really connected with the, the real world in the recent season um, is that you opened up about living with uh, autism and yes. you were widely praised for promoting awareness and, and de-stigmatization. Um, I thought the conversation you had with, with Kaser, who was another contestant, was really um, just, just helping to help, like better educate the public about individual differences. Um, You've said it's unique, but it's a good thing. It's just a different ability. Right. Uh, what kinds of abilities do you think living with autism has given you? I think that it, it definitely has helped in certain aspects, especially academic ones. I think that it definitely helps with memorization ability. I think quantitative ability, um, it's really helpful. And just being able to um, sort of break down information when I would have to learn something new or put it into a systemic way that I understand, I find that it's, it's really, really useful for that. So I think that it's, it's, a, it's an ability in a way in those areas. Um, there are trade-offs, right? Um, so I think that I, you know, I, in order to get that, I, I have to exchange a little bit in terms of you know, maybe picking up on social cues or something like that, but I feel like it is a net positive for me. That, that's great. And um, I think that like, it, it's something that there, there seems to be limited awareness or less awareness than there could be. Um, a, a few of the other contestants came under public fire. Um, and, yeah. and personally watching it, I was, I was upset um, for, for kind of mocking behaviors associated with, uh, with autism. Uh, what was yeah. your perception and, and how do you think we might better uh, educate ourselves yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, obviously the incident that happened was definitely really unfortunate. Um, you know, I've gotten apologies um, and, I, and I appreciate that. And there seems to be genuine learning um, that's, that's come from this. So I'm just trying to view it through that perspective. Um, and I think that um, it was obviously it was an unfortunate uh, in, incident for sure. But uh, I'm just trying to look at it through the way of, look, there was awareness, um, people learned about this a little bit. And I think that that's overall, that's a positive in the end. Right. And, and r related to, you know, you are someone who's worked with students with yes. learning differences. Um, we actually met when embarking on our, our teaching careers Absolutely. together. And, and you taught AP physics for five years, is that? Yeah, so I taught uh, physics and AP physics for five years. Why, why did you become a teacher? You know, it's, it's interesting because I've always had an interest in um, s sort of, you know, the, the teaching and learning side of academics. Um, I think even when I was growing up, uh, it's sort of, sort of an amusing thing, but 
my friends and I would constantly discuss, oh, well, this teacher is better than this teacher because they explain it this way. Or like we would almost always be ranking, you know, teachers by their teaching ability, which I mean, it's sort of a funny thing, but I've always sort of found it really, um, really interesting just how much effect uh, a teacher can have on student understanding. Um, so I, I've always found that to be neat and I've always liked STEM, right? Math, science, um, chemistry, physics, things, you know, the, in that realm. So I said, well, this is a nice blend of the two. Um, and uh, I just felt like that was just a, a, a neat way to go. And, and what's something that you learned from your teaching experience? I think that uh, the biggest takeaway that I have is um, every student comes from a different background, different place. Um, I think that um, every student has a different number of hours in the day, just based on personal circumstances that they can put in or, you know, their background, um, their level to which they're academically inclined, their, um, in some cases, right, like preferences, right? So I think that everyone comes in uh, with a different background. And as a teacher, it's, it's my job to sort of take that into account and to figure out for each student what is the best way in order to reach that particular student and help them meet their goal. Great. For, for you personally, what were some of the biggest challenges in doing that? I think that the biggest, um, I think the biggest challenges was with when I was teaching AP physics, that, that is a very demanding right um, I find that um, it, it's just the the level of mathematical rigor is is very very high um, and and often some problems would if I if I were to say do a model problem for for AP physics um, there are times when that one singular model problem would take somewhere around 30 minutes to to demonstrate and explain and when we were in 50 minute time period, right? Um, that can make that to be a really big challenge. Um, additionally, uh, it is calculus based uh, was the one I was teaching. And when your students are taking it concurrently with calculus, they're immediately applying what they're learning um, in their calculus courses, which they might not have you know, comfort with yet because they're right. still learning it. Um, they're immediately applying it to your course. So that's just a whole other layer of difficulty. And we would see this with the algebra-based course as well, right? Um, if there's not comfort with algebra, then doing physics problems requiring algebra becomes difficult. So you have to, you know, meet students where they're at. Right. If, if you could change one thing about our education system, what would it be? You know, I, I've actually, I've been reading up on, on Montessori's um, sort of lately, and I do think that that uh, is an interesting perspective. I think that this is sort of a, the way that I sort of see things going in an ideal world. Um, you know, I, 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 at one point or another, had considered um, teaching at a school that was using those methods, and I, I thought that it was really interesting. Um, sort of the, the more personalized approach. Yeah, it, it's certainly interesting to me as well. And, and I always wonder how it fits into the, the existing incentive structures, right? Where we right. are very much held to certain standards, certain state Absolutely. testing. Like, how do, you, how do you reconcile the two, right? Yeah, I think, actually, I think I'm glad you mentioned the word incentives because I, I know at my previous consulting job, a lot of people ask me like about, what it was like teaching. And I, I, one of the things I had said was, I think in education, there, there are more um, diametrically opposed incentives for every acting party in an education system than possibly in any other field. Um, yes. So I think that that's just really interesting, right? Like the student wants to get the best grade possible and they want to, hopefully they want to understand the material, but they want to do that in like the path of least resistance. Um, teachers want students to learn the best, uh, learn the most material possible. So it's just, it's really interesting how state standards, teachers' desires, student desires, parents' desires, 
administration, it all sort of comes into conflict. Yes, I, I agree. And I, I think it also connects with the, the short term versus long term, right? Like we're very Absolutely. good at looking, analyzing growth over a limited set of skills in a certain year. And I'm not dismissing the importance of that, but I think we have, uh, we're less capable with the tools we have, frankly, of measuring the kind of long-term impacts Absolutely. of the features you're mentioning. Absolutely. Um, I think it's, sorry, I, I, I do think it is very interesting, um, just sort of the shift um, that I, I kind of noticed, um, you know, high school, uh, middle school take and how it is sort of shifting towards this more individualized experience um, where I don't think that college is really, or, or university at least, uh, and maybe it is different, but um, from my understanding, courses are taught pretty much the same way uh, now uh, that they were when I was there. And that's pretty much the same way that it was taught in times before, right? The big lecture hall with 200 people and a PowerPoint. So it's sort of interesting that we're seeing this shift between the two um, and does the student skill set, um, you know, when they go off to university, it, what are the costs of acquiring that new skill set um, in exchange for the benefits of maybe they know more material, but now in college, they'll be less, uh, less likely to thrive in that sort of environment. It does feel like we're at a tipping point and we're having to, to re-examine like what we really prioritize. Um, right. What was your own experience like as a student? Did you enjoy school? Um, I would say I, the thing is I definitely didn't enjoy school, but I always liked learning. So I, I think that for me, um, perhaps, you know, one of, you know, one of my tendencies or quirks is that I tend to have like a little bit of disdain for authority. So um, school was in that respect, not, not particularly uh, great, but I did like learning. So um, I was always a, a, a good student um, because I was motivated to learn. Um, and I felt like in university, it was pretty similar. Um, I think that once I sort of uh, figured out how to study for particular classes, because like I said, the formats were all different and what one professor's expectations uh, could differ vastly from another one's and, and grading style even. Um, so I think for me, um, I think I, I, in a way, kind of had a little bit of an advantage over some of my peers at Tulane because at my school, I was very often used to teaching myself. Um, uh, except in a few cases. And I felt like I had already developed good study habits and good um, self-driven um, learning skills. So I think that was a big advantage there. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting how many students report that I love learning, but especially as you go through school, right. the interest in school diminishes. And I think that's something we need to focus on. Absolutely. Um, you're, you're someone who is very self-driven. I mean, you uh, have, in the time I've known you, I think you've gone from being a fairly new backgammon player to now, are, are you a master backgammon player or what's your uh, So right now we, we don't have tournaments with which you can go out and earn those titles, but the level that I play at, um, you know, in tournaments that I've been in online is very consistently, um, and, and comfortably enough that once we start having live tournaments again, I should be able to just go out and get the master's title um, with relative ease. So yes. That's, that's great. And, and what's your process look like? Like what has made you interested and then how yeah. have you gone about studying? I think that um, for me, um, the way that I, I like to study is, um, well, I guess two things. One, I do play quite a bit. I, I play a lot. Um, I really enjoy playing backgammon. I think it's a great game. It's a great game, I think, to play for a little bit of money um, just because I think that sort of motivates one to improve uh, when it counts for something. Um, so I play a lot and there's software, uh, Extreme Gammon is what it's called, that you can run any match that you play online through. If you record a live match, you can manually input it into that system. So um, 
essentially any time I play a match, um, whether it be online or live, I will put it into this software one way or another. And it will tell you exactly how well you played, what mistakes you made, how much those mistakes cost you in terms of equity. Um, so I will really go ahead and review those mistakes. And if there's a match that I play uh, at a level that I think is not really acceptable, I work with a, a grandmaster player um, that I review that match with and sort of try to get a conceptual idea of uh, what I did wrong. I've worked with a few different players um, over time. When I was intermediate, I worked with uh, one. I switched to a different one um, to get to me to the level that I'm at now. And, and now I've been working with, uh, with a GM to uh, sort of just better that, that understanding. So it sounds like long hours, deliberate practice under the guidance of a, of a master player. Um, what's your relationship like? You mentioned the software. We've seen yeah. many games be revolutionized, right? right. Like I'm, I'm more familiar with, with poker, with right. chess, uh, these games where, uh, you know, if you go back a couple decades, you were right. a top human player, you're like, I'm one of the top known entities in the universe at this game. Right. That's no longer the case. So how, how do you perceive like uh, the presence of AIs in this game? What's yeah. The so I think that, um, I think that it is really interesting. Um, so essentially with backgammon um, in the eighties and nineties, um, my understanding is the level of play was very poor. Um, it was very difficult to become good at backgammon because um, there, backgammon is a game that, again, it has to, like, like Big Brother, it has to be taken frame by frame because the dice can send it into any, any one of a lot of different directions. So um, often it's difficult to know exactly how a game will turn out. With the software the AI does, it's a neural net that's played against itself many, many times and thus has figured out exactly what the probabilities of winning in in given positions um, would be. Um, in the 80s and 90s, if you wanted to do that, you had to roll out games by hand and play them out yourselves hundreds of times and record the results. So I feel like um, the software sort of revolutionized it. Um, if you pull up a list of players, um, top players from the 80s and 90s era, and you know some of their older matches that have been found that were you know transcribed um, have been put into this software. And it is really interesting because um, the people that were playing the best then are probably only slightly better than the level that I'm playing now. Um, and on top of that, I think that it's, um, it's really interesting. Players that were considered bad players or, or maybe they, they would say, oh, this player is just really lucky, um, whatever they find that that player was actually doing things right um, because uh, they, you know, maybe they, they like to play straightforward games where they're just racing their checkers home and it's not going to be difficult decisions. Well, the computer tends to like those games because more often than not, it's better than what people were trying to do in the, in the seventies, eighties, where they're essentially just outsmarting themselves, complicating things too much. Hmm. I was going to ask if it's ever possible to adopt uh, an exploitative approach in, in backgammon. Um, in, in, in poker, uh, there's this ongoing debate right. where you have the, the advocates for a game theory optimal approach, which mm -hmm. is um, I'm, I'm adopting this Nash equilibrium based strategy. I can't be exploited. Or if my opponent is, is imperfect, is deviating from a, an optimal strategy, maybe I'm better off actually targeting their specific right. weaknesses. Do you see that in backgammon? So I think it is actually, that's very a very good question. I think in backgammon, you do see this um, quite a lot. And um, I, I generally will say that I disagree with it. I think that in general, the GTO approach is probably the best way to go um, for, a, for a few reasons. And, and I think everyone is guilty of saying, oh, I only did this because whatever. And I feel like that often will do more harm than good. Um, just, just for example, um, I know today, even just as an example today, I had a tournament match against a player that I knew was stronger than me. Um, by a few 
you know, we call it PR, performance rating points um, per the software. I knew that he was a stronger player. So um, in backgammon, games can be worth different amounts of points through use of a doubling cube that's kind of like raising uh, the stakes in, in poker. And uh, there were times where it was a 13-point match, and I sort of realized, I was like, well, right now I'm definitely getting the best of it in this position, and this might not be a technical uh, point at which I should recube to four points, but if things hold and it breaks my way, it's going to give me a, a, a nice-sized advantage, or he's doubling me here, it's volatile, maybe it's not a take, but I, I want to see the, the variance uh, jump up by, by making these volatile situations with larger amounts of points in play uh, happen, right? Um, so I found that after the match, when I went ahead and analyzed it, um, there was, those cube actions were mistakes, uh, one of them pretty sizable. And if I hadn't done that, the difference, the difference in PR, the difference in skill was nowhere near um, to nowhere near a point at which I should have been taking that much equity loss in exchange for this um, supposed, oh, I just want to get the cube in when I'm good, right? right. Um, so I feel like most players, including myself, tend to overdo it. And the other thing that I, I find really interesting is that um, many players will say something along the lines of, oh, well, I know that this is the right play, but I'm going to do this because, um, you know, I'm playing my opponent. And I find that saying that, and, and I'm guilty of it too, I feel like that is, um, it's, it's almost borderline cocky because it, it almost just insinuates that you, if you wanted to play perfectly, you could. And um, you'll, you'll only make mistakes because you want to make mistakes. And I feel like that generally just is not the case. Most players overdo it. And I think that for the vast majority of players, um, unless the skill discrepancy is vast, uh, right? I think that uh, most players would be best off um, taking the GTO approach. And that's generally what I strive to do. Um, yeah, I'll venture down that lane every once in a while. Like if I'm playing a really like a really bad opponent in a long match. Do I want to see a 16 cube in a volatile situation? Obviously not. Um, but I think most of the time, uh, most players overdo it. And I would say there's maybe less than 50 players in the world that can, uh, can adopt a non-GTO strategy uh, or tactics in an efficient way. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. I, I do think it's easy to come up with these post hoc justifications of right. I did this, but um, but and and also as as players continue to get better, right, um, and their their strategies are more GTO, it becomes harder and harder to exploit. So if you're playing at a high right. level, I imagine you find less less opportunities. Uh, generally, generally yes, and, and like I said today. Um, I knew when I saw the draw for this round, it was a, you know, a modified Swiss uh, format. I knew that I was not getting the best of it in terms of skill. So um, this, this guy is not making a ton of mistakes. Um, it's an extremely strong player. And I'm generally not going to make that many either. Um, but, uh, you know, I think it's almost in a way sort of like doubting my own ability to play in a, in a in a correct GTO way, there's not, I, I definitely cost myself equity in doing that more so than if I had just played it uh, the right way. Hmm. Out of curiosity, is there a gender imbalance at the, at the top levels of backgammon? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I think it's, uh, I, I would be really surprised if I were to pull up um, just like the rankings of players in the world based on performance rating. Um, I would say maybe um, top 50 to maybe even 100 are probably all male. Mm -hmm. um, I think the best female player in the world, I think general consensus is uh, a Japanese woman who's an extremely strong player. Um, but 
Uh, and I'm not exactly sure where she's playing in terms of performance uh, performance rating, but she's extremely strong, but she's one of the few. Yeah, it's interesting that you see that across some of these strategy games, right? Like, I think right. if you go to the World Series of Poker, it's like 97% men. Right. Uh, in, in chess, plenty of women play, but like in the top 100, I think there's only right. one or two women. And so I'm wondering, like, do you feel like more can be done to encourage women getting? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think that there's there's obviously a lot of potential, um, you know, for there to be more strong female players because they, I mean, it. I, I feel like, you know, I, I'm a big, um, you know, like there's this idea of, you know, there's like, um, you know, for instance, like a ladies tournament, right? And it's, I almost find it like that seems almost antiquated, right? Yeah, it's it's tough because at the same time, like you can understand, uh, you know, if if female players feel more comfortable, like right into the game initially, right? But exactly. at the same time, you're like, wait, hold on, you're just as capable. You can compete on an equal footing here, right? Um, and and I, I find that interesting. I I think I had read recently that the top female chess player in the world does not like playing. Uh, ladies events because of you know because of that reason right um and right. I, I i find that to be an interesting take um obviously I, I i think there should absolutely be more women in the game i do think that um unfortunately i think that um in the 80s probably 70s um in games like poker and probably in the modern era as well i'd have to imagine um it's probably a very frosty environment for female players um I mean, I've definitely heard a lot of um, stories in the poker world about this, um, you know, sort of sexualizing or, or harassment. And I think that's obviously extremely unfortunate. And I think that's a big turnoff to uh, potential female players. And that, I think that's just unacceptable. Yeah, it, it's easy to see the kinds of obstacles that that woman might face. I'm hoping that like through through efforts, like we're going to see um, more equity over time. Um, more, I, I actually just watched the the Queen's Gambit. I don't know if you've had it. Right. See that, I haven't seen it, but yeah, I've heard. Yeah, it's just about redefining like who who is capable of excelling at the highest levels in in these um, absolutely games, right. Yeah. Uh, great. Uh, well, I think that's a good um, note to to end it on. But really, want to thank you for for taking taking the time to share. Um, I think you have uh, a a really unique strategic mind. And the same uh, strategic insights that you've applied to Big Brother uh, as, as a teacher, as a backgammon player. Um, I think that there's uh, a core skill set there that can be applied to making good decisions in life uh, generally. Um, so definitely excited to, to um, see, see where your energies take you next. Uh, do you, are you focusing uh, on backgammon in the, in the months ahead? Um, right now, yes. Um, not exactly sure um, what I'm doing as far as employment goes. Um, when I'm not playing games, my day job has been management consulting. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm obviously looking at jobs in that space. I'm also looking at other uh, fields, uh, investment uh, groups, uh, other quantifiable uh, areas. So not exactly sure which way I'm going right now, but uh, definitely keeping my options open and enjoying backgammon in the meantime. Right, yeah, I, I, as um, Kesar, who again is a contestant uh, on, on Big Brother, I, he said you know, that he thought that your ability to like, really look for patterns and things, to be self-directed, to have that kind of obsession to really like, just get fully into a pursuit, like right. I have no doubt that whatever it is to, that you decide to pursue next, um, you'll you'll be successful at it. So thank you for taking the time. For listeners who want to um, like follow your your endeavors and your backgammon, like where can they find you? Yeah, so I'm uh, I'm on uh, Twitter, um, and that's going to be at Tulane, uh, like the university. Terry, all one word. And on Instagram, I'm on there as Ian P Terry fourteen, all one word. Okay, great. And we can include those in the, in the description. Absolutely. But yeah, thanks, Ian. It's great to catch up with you. All right. Sounds good. Thank you for having me. Thank you.